I've never really liked this concept of like coming out and I had to really learn to reframe it as inviting in, um, which felt a lot more comfortable to me to think of um, inviting people into this thing that's a big part of my life, um, but like really inviting people into a circle of trust as opposed to coming out of this like dark, dark closet. Place, exactly. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Hello, my name is Gay Anderson and you are listening to Lost Spaces, the podcast that mourns the death of queer nightlife. Every episode, I talk to a different person about a venue from their past, the memories that they created there, and the people that they used to know. So, books. Books. Ah, oh, glorious books. I think books were my absolute best friend when I was growing up and they seemed to always provide comfort and solace and a glimpse into other lives that were a bit less shitty than mine and you know just gave that opportunity to escape everything that was happening in my everyday life which let's be honest was mostly school and the horrors that lie within. And there's also something so wonderfully magical about being surrounded by books in a library or in a bookshop and just being surrounded by all the possibilities and the universes that lie within those pages. And I have a bit of a hunch that I might not be the only one that feels this way. In fact, this week I am joined by author Lamia H, who found themselves drawn to the queer, trans and sex worker run bookshop Blue Stockings when they were just a fresh transplant to New York City. Uh, and before we go any further, I do need to say Blue Stockings is still very much a business. It's still very much alive, but it is no longer at its original location of Allen Street, which is where Lamia first found it all those years ago and fell under its spell, dare I say. Oh, and before we get into this episode, we talk a little bit about Lamia's new memoir, Hijab Butch Blues. And if you're interested in finding out more or snagging yourself a copy, whether physical or digital, make sure to follow the links in the show notes to this episode. Right, why don't we get into it? often call New York um, the best city in the world, which I absolutely think it is. And, you know, you can fight me um, if you don't agree. Um, <laughs> what, what kind of fight? Are you doing like an arm <laughs> wrestle, thumb war? You know what? I, I think I could take you in any of those, Kay. <laughs> <laughs> oh, it's on. Okay, let's go. <laughs> um, but my first memories of moving here are um, I moved for grad school and um, one of my one of my closest friends came and helped me set up my books. Uh, she came and um, unpacked all my books for me and arranged them all in alphabetical order because that's how I was arranging them then. Um, I don't do that anymore. And now they're by color. But yeah, I guess my first memories are just sort of like setting up my place, um, grad school, and just just like a, a little bubble um, of the sort of like two or three streets uh, between grad school, where I was living. Um, and then from there, I remember the first few months being really, really miserable because I didn't really know anyone um, and I didn't know how to make friends and how to how to meet people. But then it was like a progressive build, you know, like my love for it really, really. Um, it didn't it's not that it snuck up on me, but it just like built over time. And um, I've lived here, I guess I moved in 2009. Um, so I've lived here almost 15 years now. So yeah. Okay, so I want to find out how to make friends mm. because I think that's something that you've since learned and I want to find out more about that. But before that, let's go back to like these very first few days that you were in New York. And I want you to think about like where your head was at at that time. You came for grad school, obviously, mm -hmm. as you said. 
Did you have like a master plan? I didn't. Um, and I think that's why I was miserable um, because uh. I just like, I knew I was in school, but I didn't really know what I was doing with my life. I mean, I think that's the beauty of being in your early 20s. Um, and, you know, those first few years out of undergrad when, you know, I, I think that's when you really learn to be a person when you're, you know, 22, 23, 24. Um, I, I felt like kind of thrown into it. And I was definitely a little bit like, well, how do I want to spend my days? Who are the people that I want to be friends with? Um, what are the spaces that I want to visit? How do I want to sort of like find Muslim community? Um, how do I want to um, how do I want to explore this like queerness thing that is something that I recently have like words for? Um, yeah. yeah, isn't it funny? So you, what you've just said has really sparked something in my brain that it's so totally unfair that we put this pressure on people in their late teens, early 20s to figure their shit mm. out and to know who they want to be for the rest of their lives. But without that pressure, they don't have anything to rally against mm. and rebel against and like become the person that they want despite that pressure. Mm. I think part of it is also until then your life has been so... Um, uh, mapped out. Mapped out, yeah. There's like, th mm -hmm. there's the thing that you do next. And then suddenly, you know, you're in grad school or you have a job and, you know, like suddenly it's that map disappears and you really have to figure that out for yourself. Um, yeah. But no one says to you like, oh, it's okay because right. you are going to fuck up and you're going to not know and you're going to figure it out as you go along. Like no one ever says that to you and that's never the expectation. Everyone always feels this immense pressure to be like, okay, oh God, okay, now I'm going to make a plan. Right. And I think part of it is also we live lives that are so bubbled. Um, like when I was, you know, 22, 23, 24, I didn't really have intergenerational friendships. Did you? I think that's also mm -hmm. a part of it that uh, we're not around other people who can tell us these things and especially as queer people who don't necessarily have sort of like models for how to live our lives I think it like we just don't know and we don't mm. see other people doing it yeah but you do have your parents mm. you know I, my parents never said that to me my parents were always like okay but you've got to figure it out you've got mm. to decide what you want to do rather than oh do you know it's all right if you just mess around for a few years because school will still be there and decisions will still be able to be made mm. I think for me part of it was also that I just didn't want lives like my parents um mm. you know my my parents were still living in the Middle East at that point and they were living these lives that were very um that worked for them um they did mostly the same thing every day um and then mostly the same thing every weekend and I just I didn't want a life like that and so part of going to New York, so being in a different country to your parents, was that an intentional thing? Like, I need to get away and figure things out? Yeah, I mean, it was it was a little bit more complicated than that. I kind of had to leave for undergrad because the place where I grew up didn't have any universities that were open to non-citizens ah, at okay. that point. I, I had to I had to go somewhere for college, um, and you know, I I got really lucky and ended up with a, like just financially to, uh, to to go to like a really good school in the U.S., which, so it, yeah, it, in some ways, everything that has happened subsequent is because of getting really lucky and getting to go to school here um, in some ways. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and then, and then I ended up in New York. Hmm. And so you've just said when you were talking about those first days in New York that you'd recently figured out your queerness mm -hmm. or that there was this kind of seed of an idea that you might be queer forming. Can you talk a bit about that? Yeah, I mean, it's something that when I look back on, I remember all of the feelings, but I also remember not necessarily having a word for them. Uh, I wrote this book, a memoir called Hijab Butch Blues, and in the first chapter, one of the things I talk about is hearing the story of Maryam, um, also known as the Virgin Mary, um, in Quran class, and having this moment where, um, so the story goes that this like beautiful man angel comes to Maryam um, when she's in isolation um, and, you know, living alone in a temple. And he comes to tell Maryam that she's going to have a baby, 
also known as Jesus. And Maryam like just wants nothing to do with this man. She tells him to go away. And, you know, I, at 14, I had this spark of recognition that, wait, there are other people like this um, in the Quran. Like, there, <laughs> there are other people who feel this way about men. So I, I remember all of the feelings, but I didn't necessarily have words for them. Um, and some of the words came sort of in college as I was around other people um, who identified as queer very sort of like openly. And then uh, also in the city, um, when I moved here, um, just being around people, finding myself in spaces. Uh, so it it's so hard to put a time to when um, I started identifying as queer in this very sort of like definitive way um, because it feels like it just kind of happened I, I knew of it but it just happened slowly and then one day mm. I was like this is a thing and so you've talked about language and not having the language in order to describe the way you were feeling or the way that you particularly identified and I know you've just said like it's really hard to pinpoint when when I figured it out for myself did you have a concept of queerness before you got to the U.S.? Queerness operates really differently um, in the place that I grew up. Um, it's less of an identity and more just like a thing. So, for example, in high school, like I knew that there were these two girls who were, I guess, like dating together or whatever. And it just like wasn't a big deal. Like everyone knew, um, but it just it, it wasn't a big deal because, yeah, I, I don't necessarily know that I understand why it wasn't a big deal but it just wasn't mm. um but was it not like a thing because kids just accept things without questioning yeah maybe and it also just I think operates differently in the country that I grew up um I think the idea of sexuality as an identity is a very American thing in a particular way and again like not mm. this isn't to say that that idea isn't globalized because it gets exported um because of like TV, media, et cetera. But at least when I was growing up, it just like didn't feel like an identity. And, you know, also this was a really long time ago. This was, you know, in the 90s and early 2000s. And um, I, I feel like Don't say queerness... that's a long time ago. That's not a long time ago. That's like five years ago. <laughs> no, it is a really <laughs> long time ago. But I, I don't know if you feel like this, but I just, I feel like the world was so different in terms of gayness now to the extent that like I look at kids these days and I'm like, oh my God, kids these days, are you even gay if you don't remember the <laughs> angst and the like looking for um, just seeing uh, characters on TV that make eye contact and you're like, oh my God, they're gay. You know what I mean? As opposed to like yeah. very like... Yeah, definitively being gay. Yeah, I, I don't know. The early 2000s, very different time. Okay. Well, first of all, dear listener, I want to say that the very first instance in this conversation of someone saying kids these days was <laughs> not me. So just want to celebrate that quickly. Second of all, yeah, it's so interesting, isn't it? Because so much of my identity has been formed by searching mm. and looking mm. and interpreting and mm. like figuring things out over a really long period of time and having mm. all of that wonderful but terrible gestation period mm. <laughs> I don't know why I chose those words sorry but like it's just stewing <laughs> in my juices ah oh, yeah okay my imagery today is off but like, it's fascinating to me that there are people who will just be at an age where they're like, oh, do you know what? I'm not the same as other people in my class. Mm. But I'm this thing over here. Oh, that's fine. Oh, off I go and I'm going to discover about it. Like, that's so foreign and weird. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. I have nothing to add to that, but yeah, absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. It, it's wonderful, but it's also... I think one of the things that I talk about a lot on the show and that I think is one of the real gifts of queerness mm. is that you're forced to examine who you are and mm -hmm. you're forced to look inwards and think about who you want to be and how you want to intentionally live your life. And, and I think that our heterosexual counterparts don't have that mm. opportunity until they're 50 and going through a midlife crisis and decide to blow up their world and start again. Oh, but fun. <laughs> we're going to get to a point where, like, no one is having those existential crises at 13. 
do I want to live in that world? Well, but in some ways, <laughs> that's the world that we've been fighting for, right? And mm-hmm. and it's here. Um, I mean, it, also, it's not entirely here. Um, yeah, yeah. Queer yeah, people, yeah. you know, um, queer youth especially, still face ridiculously high rates of poverty, of getting kicked out of their houses, et cetera, um, and, and harassment and violence. Um, but yeah, there's something about it that feels both hopeful and maybe it's just that we don't want it forgotten. Does that make sense, Kay? Like, I, I think about that a lot, um, the politics of forgetting and remembrance and what gets remembered. And I just, I want that remembered. I want it remembered that we fought so hard, that we had all this existential angst, that we really looked inwards and we like really mapped out different ways to live um we did all of that and it was hard and yeah and there was also something sort of like beautiful and bonding about it and helped us build communities and I just I don't want that forgotten um Mm. yeah but will it be remains to be seen hmm Okay, so one of the other things that I made a note of and that I want to pick up is that you talked about being lonely Mm. when you first moved to New York and uh, how it took you a while to figure out how to make friends. How did that happen? So it, it took a month or two for me to recognize that I was lonely. The the people in my grad program were really nice. The handful of people that I knew from undergrad that had moved to the city were also great. But I was sort of like itching to find other people and to really sort of like feel embedded in community. Um, And so um, the first, actually the first time that I intentionally friend chased was uh, Ramadan was starting and I was like, okay, there is, you know, this mosque slash Islamic center in the city that has a lot of young folks my age. I am going to go there every day for iftar and I do really well with the whole like everyday goals like even if I don't meet them even if I fail at the goal but just having that as a goal feels really great so I started going every day and as I started going I saw the same people over and over and started talking to them and uh, got invited to things and this is going to be a trip down memory lane but um one of the people that I befriended and that I friend chased was this woman who um, was maybe like two or three years older than me and um, was someone that I found myself falling in love with. She was straight, um, which uh, is also something that I write about in my book. Um the ways in which I went through a really long straight girls phase um, (laughs) in my early queerness, which, you know, is actually not that uncommon. Um, I have heard other people talk about this too. And there's, I I think there's something there to be explored um, around why that feels safe and um, accessible. And when you're still sort of like figuring yourself out. Well, let's explore that now then. So first, yeah. I mean, first of all, I want to say, first time I've ever heard the phrase friend chased. So mm-hmm. very impressed. I'm going to start weaving that into my everyday conversation. Second of all, the straight girl phase. Like, obviously, I'm not asking you to speak on behalf of everyone. But for you, you've just said that it kind of felt more comfortable. You know, I... I think back on it a lot now and um, I I hear the voice of my friend who I had adopted as my queer life mentor who (laughs) was just like this lovely person who I I really like saw as an aspirational version of myself. They were really incredible and they, they had also gone through a straight girl phase and they were trying to get me out of it. Yeah, that they would talk a lot about this, that there's something that feels safe about crushing on someone that is entirely inaccessible, but that will also, you know, kind of like flirt back because you're entirely inaccessible to them. But yeah, um, mm. there's something about it that I remember feeling really um, good, almost in this like self-destructive way that you know, you can have these feelings and they feel fun and new and um, 
there's something just so joyful about crushing and you get to yeah. experience all of those feelings without it ever turning into the feelings that lead to existential crises like you know what does this mean in terms of my queerness what happens next what do i want to happen next um yeah i don't know i i, I wallowed in those for a, a long time Ah, oh, how wonderful is it to wallow in crushes? Mm-hmm. But, but so are you kind of saying that it's this more innocent type of thing because you never ever move beyond that initial infatuation? I don't know if innocent is the right word because I think it, I think it is like destructive um, and a little bit of sort of self-sabotage like I I don't know if innocent is the right word I think it's more um comfortable and safe yeah because you don't have to step outside you know what you know you can just sit there and you don't have to push yourself but but in the first one at least you're pushing yourself beyond something that you've experienced before right yeah somewhat although I, I guess like in my case I had I had previously had crushes on straight girls, but yeah, I I don't know that I had the words for them yet. Um, But yeah, the big one, um, the big one when I moved to New York was probably um, the one where I first was like, wait, these are feelings. Um, This is real. And it was also the first time I told someone that I liked her. and oh what so you told this person i did i did yeah Ah, okay no oh wait (gasps) not not the queer mentor i told the woman that i had a crush on that (sighs) i had feelings for her oh okay paint the scene for me so Mm -hmm. how long had you known her when you told her this uh maybe two years and how did the conversation go was it face to face Um, pretty terribly yeah it was face to face um which sorry i'm getting excited no (laughs) No, it's okay yeah 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 no um (laughs) i'm also looking back on this and being like wow go me um i told her she said that if i had been a man things would have been different which was really really hard to hear um (laughs) and then that's it and then we hung out again, like, two days later and pretended like it, d- it oh. hadn't happened. Yeah. Oh, so that wasn't, like, the end of the friendship. No, 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 it, it wasn't, yeah. In fact, then it kind of felt a little bit more like I was waiting for her to make a move. And, like, it felt like, you know, I, I thought that by telling her that some of the uncertainty would dissipate, but it didn't. But it did take the pressure away from you having to do or say anything because you'd already done it yes and the ball was in her court yes yeah. exactly yeah how interesting because yeah. yeah usually those types of conversations if the feelings are unreciprocated end in the friendship drifting apart so nice to hear that it continued yeah I mean it did eventually drift apart but not because of that does that mm-hmm. make sense yeah, yeah. absolutely yeah. Uh, and so we were talking about making friends when mm-hmm. when this woman came up. This woman. Um, what other tactics and, like, what was making friends like in New York City in those early okay. days? Okay. Excellent question. So a big one for sure was, you know, going to the mosque, like, every day for Ramadan. Um, and then another one was just, like, being really intentional about the people that I did meet um, and following up with them, Um And then what are other ways that I made friends? Um, I started going to protests and organizing, and that was also another big one. Um, I met a lot of people that way and definitely like friend chased so hard there. And yeah, um, I went to a lot of... uh, I went to a lot of events. Um, this was back in the day when people would post events on Facebook. And so it was really easy to sort of like trawl through and see what was going on. I went to a lot of readings. I went to a lot of poetry readings. Um, I went to like anything that I could get my hands on. And how do you friend chase someone without putting them off entirely? That's a good question. I'm sure there are lots of people that I have put off. Uh, so um, for me, it's it's a lot of follow-up. Like, 
writing people, um, writing people back, um, making plans. You know how people do that thing where they're like, oh, let's get coffee. And then that never actually happens oh, because you're always like, yeah, well, how about next weekend? Oh, I can't do next weekend. How about the weekend after? Um, yeah, but just like really like putting effort into like putting out dates, like really, really like sticking to them. But how do you do that without coming across as passive aggressive? <laughs> Oh my God, <laughs> that might be a better question for the people that I have friend chased. <laughs> I just did it. Maybe everyone who stuck around was impervious to passive aggression. Mm, okay, okay. Maybe I just need to get over that hump because I'm one of those people who's like, well, I tried once. That's it. <laughs> they must hate me. Oh, so my other thing is that, like, I, I tell myself in my head that I have nothing to lose, that if um, there's someone that I'm talking to or, you know, if I, like, sit next to someone at an event and I strike up a conversation with them and if I'm like, oh, let's get coffee, like, can I have your number or whatever, and if they say, no, I have nothing to lose, this is what I tell myself in my head. Um, and mm. so it also helps get over the hump of, like, the awkwardness of like, hey, let's hang out sometime. You know, does that make sense? Oh, yeah, yeah, absolutely. And I think yeah, yeah. definitely a, a lesson that I need to yeah. learn. Yeah. And the, the <laughs> other thing about living in New York, aka the best city in the world, is that it's so big that you might never see these people again. Um, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But, you know, also sometimes mm -hmm. you do and it's awkward as fuck. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, or you just like, you know, it's only ever as awkward as you make it, right? Yeah. And, you know, I'm an awkward person in general, and I think that that helps because then I can be like, how much more awkward could it be? It's awkward already because I'm awkward. <laughs> <laughs> words to live by, words to live by. <laughs> the, so I want to ask questions that you probably get asked a lot and I just want to upfront say really sorry mm -hmm. that I'm going to make you talk about things that you've probably talked ad infinitum about already. Uh, going to mosque and meeting people mm. that way, mm -hmm. did you feel any friction with your queer identity? Mm. I mean, not immediately, but the more and more I became friends with people and the more that I wasn't out to certain folks who were like big parts of my life, that's mm -hmm. when it started to feel frictiony and... Yeah. But, you know, initially, as you're getting to know people, as you sort of like are praying next to people or just like breaking fast next to people, not really. Um, but I think it was when I became really, really, really close friends with people that it felt a little bit like sometimes it felt like I was at a juncture. Is that the right word? Juncture. Junction. 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 Yeah. Junction. Um, it felt like I was at a junction because it felt like I couldn't share a lot about myself mm. if I was hiding this thing and again you know these are all things that I was figuring out in my like late 20s like who do I tell that I'm queer I've, I've never really liked this concept of like coming out and I had to really learn to reframe it as inviting in um, which felt a lot more comfortable to me to think of um, inviting people into this thing that's a big part of my life um, but like really inviting people into a circle of trust as opposed to coming out of this like dark Shadowy, dark secret closet place, exactly yeah. yes yeah but yeah that's that's when I started to feel like I wanted to share or that I didn't want to share and it felt like my it, it felt like a, a lot of my friendships actually sort of like either dissolved or became tighter because um because I either decided that this wasn't someone that I wanted to invite in or yeah. that it was someone that I did and they were really lovely about it mm. So, like, so my immediate response here is reflecting on my own experiences because mm. I'm a self-centered human being. And I think for me, a lot of the time, like, my queerness is front and center. Mm. And so if I'm going to make any effort in getting to know someone, like, that has to be something that, that they're aware of immediately. Mm. I mean, it's pretty pretty difficult for them not to be but 
like, do you still approach friendships in this way? I think this is the question I'm asking, where you get to know someone and then you open up about that. Somewhat, but not really. I mean, I don't know if this has happened to you, but I don't have a ton of straight friends anymore, um, (laughs) which... There are a lot of straight people out there, though. You do meet them quite a lot. (laughs) They're everywhere. No, actually, that's not entirely true. I still have some uh, straight friends, but... um, Yeah, I mean, I think queerness has also become a way for me to make friends now. And so I don't. Mm. Yeah, so it it does end up being like front and center in some ways or or I'll make a lot of friends through sort of organizing and activism. And then like and then in those spaces, um, most people will be like super queer friendly and I'll be um, very open about my queerness. Um, Yeah. Hmm. Okay, so. We need to get onto blue stockings. Yes. <laughs> Sorry, I've done such a terrible job of navigating this conversation. Where does blue stockings come into your time in New York? So, um, as I was exploring the city, um, I, I love bookstores. Um, I love them so much. Um, there's just something about a curated selection of books that makes me happy and gives me a lot of joy. And so, Uh, One of the things that I wanted to do when I moved to New York was like visit all these bookstores. Um, So I I went to a whole bunch of them. And one of the ones that kept coming up frequently on the list that I would see on the Internet was Blue Stockings. And this was back when Blue Stockings was on Allen Street. It had to shut down for a while and then moved um, to and is now maybe like 20 minute walk away from where it used to be. But um, that location on Allen Street was the one that I visited in my 20s. And I just like fell in love with the space. It was just such an incredible space. Um, It had books, but it also had a cafe where people would sit and hang out and, you know, just sort of like browse through books. There were posters, there were zines, there were t-shirts, and it very specifically called itself a feminist bookstore. Um, And it had events. And, you know, the, the thing that was so cool about it, too, was that it felt like you could go sit there for hours and hours and hours and just, you know, have a bunch of books and sort of like leaf through them or in my case, like shamelessly read them as I did uh, many times um, when I was a poor grad student. Yeah, it just it felt like the space where people hung out and and also like talk to other people. That was also really cool about it. Mm. Like, you know, especially when we talk about sort of like friend chasing or um, or getting over the awkwardness of just talking to people next to you um but yeah I just I remember sitting there with you know a stack of books and a glass of lemonade um because I'm not a coffee drinker um and just talking to people in fact I remember this one time I talked to someone who invited me to a roller derby um (laughs) bout which was like one of the coolest things ever I mean have you have you have been to a roller derby bout I highly recommend everyone check them out um (laughs) okay so let's go back a step so yes I, I kind of love this idea of you with a list of bookshops that you have to attack in New York City. Is that how it was? Like a, a bookshop to-do list? A hundred percent. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> uh, was it on a spreadsheet though or was it just a list? You <laughs> it get extra wasn't points if it was a spreadsheet. <laughs> it wasn't in a spreadsheet, but I think it was a Google Doc. Um, Ooh, okay. Was it even a Google? Would it have been a Google Doc? I think it was a Word Doc because it was definitely like in the early days of Google Docs. <laughs> and I want you to try and remember this first time that you ever went to Blue Stockings and imagine yourself walking in and tell me how that feels. It feels both familiar in this way, like I feel sort of like really comfortable um, because I see all these books and I know what to do when I see books. I Mm. can go and sort of like browse and like touch them and read the backs and look at what books they have and don't have. Um, But then also it feels like a new world um, because there are all of these people and there are all of these other things. There are these zines. Um, One of the booksellers was actually a friend from college, um, was like a lab partner from sophomore year in college. So it it also felt like a 
continuation of the people that I knew. Um, I would also bump into people there. Um, yeah, so it felt both a space that I knew what to do in and a space that sort of like pushed myself in certain ways, just both familiar and unfamiliar. And what did this space come to mean to you after you started accessing it? It felt like a space that I could um, really just hang out in. Um, I think what felt hard for me sometimes um, with the queer scene is that it was so bar focused or like Mm -hmm. club focused or just like nightlife focused. And those weren't necessarily things that I found fun. Um, I would go to things once in a while, but I always felt like I was shouting to be heard and Mm -hmm. couldn't have a real conversation and I don't drink. And so I would, you know, nurse my ginger beer for hours, um, that sort of thing. But yeah, it just, it felt like an antidote to some of those things. It felt like a way to hang out with other queer people. And, you know, to be totally fair, the first, like, the first many times that I went there, I was just like sat there being like, oh, cool. Oh, my God. Look at all of these amazing, beautiful queer folks. Um, <laughs> it eventually, yeah, it really felt like a place that I could hang out and talk to people and like go to different events, um, hear about all these like new books that were coming out and and also just sort of be. So picking up on what you just said in the first few times that you were there and seeing other people that were there and being like, oh, these people are so cool. The way that you framed that sentence has made me think that you felt like an outsider from the beginning. Yeah, it took me a little while to feel like an insider or like to feel like I was part of the community. But I think part of that was I was still trying to um, figure out where I fit in and and how to like really be queer in ways that I could own. Well, and, and so figuring out ways to fit in, you mean that in relation to a wider queer community or do you mean that in relation to yeah. the people in that space? No, I, I mean that in relation to the wider queer community. Um, when I was in my 20s, it felt like there was one way to be queer and you mm. sort of like had to do that. Um, and it involved roller derby, right? <laughs> <laughs> it involved gay bars and pride and like being out and loud and yeah um and it felt like I was looking for alternate spaces and alternate communities um even in like the non-normative uh queer spaces does that make sense I, I actually like write about this a lot in my book um I mm. feel like Uh, A lot of people tried to tell me how to be authentically gay um, and I had to really figure that out for myself and really figure out what it meant for me. Um, And so when when you say they told you, was it that they were telling you in a way that they thought was helpful or in a way that was policing you? Oh, absolutely. No, in a way that they thought was helpful. And it was it was very much like, oh, you should come out to your parents. Like, what do you mean you haven't done that yet? Like, or also a lot of like, let's go to X, Y, Z bar. That's how you meet people. That's that's how you like really get a sense of like gay culture. Um, And uh, if you don't go out, if you don't like go to all these pride events, if you don't come out to your parents, how are you really queer? Uh, You know, um, some of that like prescriptive um, uh, way of being and I and you know that those things didn't work for me and I, I really had to sort of like figure out how I wanted to be queer mm-hmm. and so before you figured out how you wanted to be queer and I do want to find out how you got there did you feel a sense of failure mm. I had enough people around me that it and I had an, enough sort of like queer folks around me that they didn't let me feel like it was a failure and more that it was a failure of imagination on the part of other people. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, But it definitely didn't feel good. Um, Yeah. Hmm. And and so how did you, how did you get there? Like, how did you build the resilience to keep going and keep looking and what leads were you following? Um, Honestly, I think the, the thing that 
made a really big difference for me was um, finding queer Muslim community and finding all these people who were living their queerness and Muslimness um, in whatever sort of like combination and way that worked. Um, you know, like some people um, identified as like culturally Muslim or some people identified as Muslimish and some people identified as sort of like queer in various ways um, and just like watching them live lives that were very different from each other but still were really sort of like true to themselves um, that really made a big difference for me it, it helped me be unapologetic about um, you know the things that I wanted to do and didn't want to do and the things that I found fun and the things that I didn't and, and this is a bit of a dumb question but I'm going to ask it anyway. I'm just going to lean into the dumbness. Before you knew that these queer Muslim people existed, did you think that queer Muslim people existed? <laughs> That's a really good question. Um, I knew that they existed, but it felt like... It felt like I didn't know how to befriend them and then it turns out that once you become friends with one you become friends with everybody because you know yeah I, I think I think the thing that was really powerful about those communities and especially in those days was the way that like things were very based on word of mouth um mm -hmm. you met other people and they told you about other people and they told you about things and they told you about events and potlucks and and people hanging out uh, w what's really lovely now is that there's so many things on social media, so many like queer Muslim orgs, um, and they're really lovely. And I've like worked and organized with a bunch of them. Um, but in those days, it felt like it felt like you were being let into a secret club, and it was hard to find the club. But once you found the club, it was just so tight knit, and people like looked out for each other, and um, it didn't feel like a social media or online thing. It felt like a in person community. Mm. I'm like I'm picking up some parallels with what you were saying about like when you first went to Blue Stockings and how you mm. weren't necessarily part of the in crowd immediately. Before mm -hmm. you met these people and, and became part of the community, did you mm -hmm. have a preconception that that might not be possible? Or am I reading too much into things? I don't, I don't know that I knew what was possible. I think sometimes, um, sometimes we're limited by our imagination and I definitely did not think that I couldn't imagine any of it. Mm. And, you know, I think that's a queer thing. Just like, again, like not seeing models, not being around other sort of like queer folks growing up, et cetera. Um, it, you don't necessarily know what's possible. You don't, you don't know the potential that's out there. And so you can't necessarily imagine it. Like when I was younger, I would like, if I would try to imagine a future for myself, I just couldn't. My, my brain just like, it just like wouldn't compute, you know? Um, oh, how interesting. Yeah. So it was just a big 404 error message. Yeah, yeah, exactly. There was just nothing there. And yeah, I would like try, but I kept coming up against nothing. How fascinating. Now I'm trying to think what I was imagining. Hmm. Mm. Hmm. <laughs> um, okay, so where were we? It was finding this community. Yes. So the other thing that I really loved about Blue Stockings um, is that it was right next door to um, a really, really small mosque. And it, was, it wasn't it was even really a mosque. It was more like a prayer room. And uh, it was mm -hmm. down a set of stairs. And it was like this tiny little like room. And you like there there would be people praying there would be Qurans and stuff like that but um mostly it was just yeah a prayer room and so I would be hanging out at blue stockings and when it would be time to pray I would just like pop next door and pray mm. and come back and there's something about that combination that just felt so lovely um and uh, you know and it, it was it was a really interesting prayer room um because the way that it was set up, it was kind of like airy and open. And in some of the other mosques um, that I've been to, there'll be like a curtain in the back and like women kind of like pray behind there or whatever. Um, and I, what I really liked about the space was that there really just like wasn't anything. It was just so bare bones that you could kind of pray wherever. Um, and that really just like brought me a lot of mm. gender euphoria. Um, it, it was it was 
really lovely. It was it was a tiny little space um, right next to my favorite radical feminist bookstore. And just the fact that they were next to each other just brought me so much joy. Mm. So Blue Stockings became a place where you spent lots of time and read lots of books for free. Mm -hmm. Did you stop going there because it had closed in order to move or did you stop going there because of other life things and you were just not in that area as much anymore? I stopped going there. Well, so I used to live right next to it too, which was just incredible. Um, It was so lovely. I was on the same block, but on the other side. And yeah, it was just so lovely because I could pop in there whenever I wanted. And then I moved um, and it became a hike and I stopped going as much. Mm. And then the shutdown happened, um, the pandemic, and um, it had to sort of like box up and it got sort of like evicted out of its spot, um, which was really sad. Um, and, you know, I, I thought that might be the end of the bookstore itself. And that was really, really tragic. But then... Um, Luckily enough, they were able to find another space and open up there. Um, it, it's so funny. It's still like a contentious space um, because all of its neighbors are trying to evict it because it hands oh. out Narcan. It like has free bathrooms for unhoused people. It just it really is like a like a community space. And unfortunately, I haven't been able to visit a ton because it's pretty far from where I live now. Mm-hmm. But I know it it still exists. It just it exists in a very different form, but it still has its like radical um, roots um, that are really like deeply based in community and care. So what need did that space fulfill for you? Just being able to be around queer people that I wasn't friends with um, and feel part of like a larger community as opposed to a smaller sort of like tight knit community um, and just feel like I could be in spaces where that weren't drinking focused or that weren't focused on dancing or going out, um, but were more focused on sort of like books, words, um, people, care. Um, Not that these are mutually exclusive with bars and clubs. Mm -hmm. Um, Those are also big places of community. Um, But for me, it felt like it felt like a space that I felt comfortable in and one that also that, that also let me be around strangers. And so why is it important to be around queer strangers? Um, possibility, um, friendships, mm. um, relationships, um, and then also just... I don't know, there's something lovely around being around people that you're not necessarily friends with, but that you you have something in common with and connect to. Yeah, there's something mm. really beautiful about that. And so what do you think Blue Stockings taught you about yourself? I think it taught me to seek out spaces that I that that, that I want to spend time in um, instead of sort of like doing the normative thing of going to wherever my friends are going. I think it Mm. taught me to say hi to strangers um, and to talk to people. Um, and enhance your friend chasing skills? Definitely. Um, <laughs> it taught me about roller derby. Um, <laughs> yeah. And then, you know, um, thanks to all of the free uh, books that I read, it just it also just taught me about... Uh... Sorry, I have no... I don't know where I was going with that, so I'm going to just drop that. <laughs> well, good no. It expanded your mind. Is that where you're going? It expanded my mind. That is 100% where I was going, Kay. (laughs) I like hit a block. (laughs) Expanded my mind, yes. 
Do you have any memories of blue stockings? Or maybe a queer space from your own scene that you would like to share? Well, if you do, why not get in touch? I want to create the biggest online record of people's memories and stories of queer clubbing, but I can't do it alone. I need your help. Go to lostspacespodcast.com. Find the section, share a lost space, and then tell me all about what it is you got up to. You could also reach out to me on Facebook or Instagram, where my handle is Lost Spaces Pod. And make sure you follow just to see clips from this week's episode. You get to see like videos and stuff. It's kind of weird, like you'd get to know what I look like. Hmm. Find out more about Lamia H by following them on Instagram at Lamia is Angry, which is probably the best Instagram handle ever, or visiting her website lamiah.com. If you enjoyed this episode, I would really appreciate if you took the time to subscribe, leave a review on your podcast platform of choice, or just tell other people who you think might be interested in giving it a little listen to. My name's Kay Anderson, and you have been listening to Lost Spaces. Lost Spaces.